Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. Tuesdays with Mori. An Old Man, A Young Man, and Life's Greatest Lesson. By Mitch Album. The Classroom. The sun beamed in through the dining room window, lighting up the hardwood floor. We had been talking there for nearly two hours. The phone rang yet again and Maury asked his helper, Connie, to get it. She had been jotting the caller's names in Maury's small black appointment book. Friends. Meditation teachers. A discussion group. Someone who wanted to photograph him for a magazine. It was clear I was not the only one interested in visiting my old professor the nightline appearance had made him something of a celebrity but I was impressed with, perhaps even a bit envious of, all the friends that Maury seemed to have. I thought about the buddies that circled my orbit back in college. Where had they gone? You know, Mitch, now that I'm dying, I've become much more interesting to people. You were always interesting. Ho. Maury smiled. You're kind. No, I'm not, I thought. Here's the thing, he said. People see me as a bridge. I'm not as alive as I used to be, but I'm not yet dead. I'm sort of, in between. He coughed, then regained his smile. I'm on the last great journey here and people want me to tell them what to pack. The phone rang again. Maury, can you talk? Connie asked. I'm visiting with my old pal now, he announced. Let them call back. I cannot tell you why he received me so warmly. I was hardly the promising student who had left him sixteen years earlier. Had it not been for Nightline, Maury might have died without ever seeing me again. I had no good excuse for this, except the one that everyone these days seems to have. I had become too wrapped up in the siren song of my own life. I was busy. What happened to me? I asked myself. Maury's high, smoky voice took me back to my university years, when I thought rich people were evil, a shirt and tie were prison clothes, and life without freedom to get up and go motorcycle beneath you, breeze in your face, down the streets of Paris, into the mountains of Tibet was not a good life at all. What happened to me? The 80s happened. The 90s happened. Death and sickness and getting fat and going bald happened. I traded lots of dreams for a bigger paycheck, and I never even realized I was doing it. Yet here was Maury talking with the wonder of our college years, as if I'd simply been on a long vacation. Have you found someone to share your heart with? he asked. Are you giving to your community? Are you at peace with yourself? Are you trying to be as human as you can be? I squirmed, wanting to show I had been grappling deeply with such questions. What happened to me? I once promised myself I would never work for money, that I would join the Peace Corps, that I would live in beautiful, inspirational places. Instead, I had been in Detroit for ten years now, at the same workplace, using the same bank, visiting the same barber. I was 37, more efficient than in college, tied to computers and modems and cell phones. I wrote articles about rich athletes who, for the most part, could not care less about people like me. I was no longer young for my peer group, nor did I walk around in grey sweatshirts with unlit cigarettes in my mouth. I did not have long discussions over egg salad sandwiches about the meaning of life. My days were full, yet I remained, much of the time, unsatisfied. What happened to me? Coach, I said suddenly, remembering the nickname. Maury beamed. That's me. I'm still your coach. He laughed and resumed his eating, a meal he had started forty minutes earlier. I watched him now, his hands working gingerly, as if he were learning to use them for the very first time. He could not press down hard with a knife. His fingers shook. Each bite was a struggle, he chewed the food finely before swallowing, 
and sometimes it slid out the sides of his lips, so that he had to put down what he was holding to dab his face with a napkin. The skin from his wrist to his knuckles was dotted with age spots, and it was loose, like skin hanging from a chicken soup bone. For a while, we just ate like that, a sick old man, a healthy, younger man, both absorbing the quiet of the room. I would say it was an embarrassed silence, but I seemed to be the only one embarrassed. Dying, Maury suddenly said, is only one thing to be sad over, Mitch. Living unhappily is something else. So many of the people who come to visit me are unhappy. Why? Well, for one thing, the culture we have does not make people feel good about themselves. We're teaching the wrong things. And you have to be strong enough to say if the culture doesn't work, don't buy it. Create your own. Most people can't do it. They're more unhappy than me even in my current condition. I may be dying, but I am surrounded by loving, caring souls. How many people can say that? I was astonished by his complete lack of self-pity. Mori, who could no longer dance, swim, bathe, or walk, Mori, who could no longer answer his own door, dry himself after a shower, or even roll over in bed. How could he be so accepting? I watched him struggle with his fork, picking at a piece of tomato, missing it the first two times a pathetic scene, and yet I could not deny that sitting in his presence was almost magically serene, the same calm breeze that soothed me back in college. I shot a glance at my watch force of habit it was getting late, and I thought about changing my plane reservation home. Then Maury did something that haunts me to this day. You know how I'm going to die, he said. I raised my eyebrows. I'm going to suffocate. Yes. My lungs, because of my asthma, can't handle the disease. It's moving up my body, this ALS. It's already got my legs. Pretty soon it'll get my arms and hands. And when it hits my lungs. He shrugged his shoulders. I'm sunk. I had no idea what to say, so I said, well, you know, I mean, you never know. Maury closed his eyes. I know, Mitch. You mustn't be afraid of my dying. I've had a good life, and we all know it's going to happen. I maybe have four or five months. Come on, I said nervously. Nobody can say, I can, he said softly. There's even a little test. A doctor showed me. A test? Inhale a few times. I did as he said. Now, once more, but this time, when you exhale, count as many numbers as you can before you take another breath. I quickly exhaled the numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I reached 70 before my breath was gone. Good, Maury said. You have healthy lungs. Now. Watch what I do. He inhaled, then began his number count in a soft, wobbly voice. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, dash, he stopped, gasping for air. When the doctor first asked me to do this, I could reach 23. Now it's 18. He closed his eyes, shook his head. My tank is almost empty. I tapped my thighs nervously. That was enough for one afternoon. Come back and see your old professor, Maury said when I hugged him good, bye. I promised I would, and I tried not to think about the last time I promised this. In the campus bookstore, I shop for the items on Maury's reading list. I purchase books that I never knew existed, titles such as Youth, Identity and Crisis, I and Thou, The Divided Self. Before college I did not know the study of human relations could be considered scholarly. Until I met Maury, I did not believe it. But his passion for books is real and contagious. We begin to talk seriously sometimes, after class, when the room has emptied. He asks me questions about my life, then quotes lines from Eric from, Martin Buber, Eric Erickson. Often he defers to their words, footnoting his own advice, 
even though he obviously thought the same things himself. It is at these times that I realize he is indeed a professor, not an uncle. One afternoon, I am complaining about the confusion of my age, what is expected of me versus what I want for myself. Have I told you about the tension of opposites, he says. The tension of opposites? Life is a series of pulls back and forth. You want to do one thing, but you are bound to do something else. Something hurts you, yet you know it shouldn't. You take certain things for granted, even when you know you should never take anything for granted. A tension of opposites, like a pull on a rubber band. And most of us live somewhere in the middle. Sounds like a wrestling match, I say. A wrestling match. He laughs. Yes, you could describe life that way. So which side wins, I ask. Which side wins? He smiles at me, the crinkled eyes, the crooked teeth. Love wins. Love always wins. Taking attendance. I flew to London a few weeks later. I was covering Wimbledon, the world's premier tennis competition and one of the few events I go to where the crowd never boos and no one is drunk in the parking lot. England was warm and cloudy, and each morning I walked the tree-lean streets near the tennis courts, passing teenagers queued up for leftover tickets and vendors selling strawberries and cream. Outside the gate was a newsstand that sold a half-dozen colorful British tabloids, featuring photos of topless women, paparazzi pictures of the royal family, horoscopes, sports, lottery contests, and a wee bit of actual news. Their top headline of the day was written on a small chalkboard that leaned against the latest stack of papers, and usually read something like Diana in row with Charles. Or Gaza 2 team, give me millions. People scooped up these tabloids, devoured their gossip, and on previous trips to England, I had always done the same. But now, for some reason, I found myself thinking about Maury whenever I read anything silly or mindless. I kept picturing him there, in the house with the Japanese maple and the hardwood floors, counting his breath, squeezing out every moment with his loved ones, while I spent so many hours on things that meant absolutely nothing to me personally, movie stars, supermodels, the latest noise out of Princess D or Madonna or John F. Kennedy Jr. in a strange way. I envied the quality of Maury's time even as I lamented its diminishing supply. Why did we, bother with all the distractions we did? Back home, the O.J. Simpson trial was in full swing, and there were people who surrendered their entire lunch hours watching it, then taped the rest so they could watch more at night. They didn't know O.J. Simpson. They didn't know anyone involved in the case. Yet they gave up days and weeks of their lives, addicted to someone else's drama. I remembered what Maury said during our visit, the culture we have does not make people feel good about themselves. And you have to be strong enough to say if the culture doesn't work, don't buy it. Maury, true to these words, had developed his own culture long before he got sick. Discussion groups, walks with friends, dancing to his music in the Harvard Square Church. He started a project called Greenhouse, where poor people could receive mental health services. He read books to find new ideas for his classes, visited with colleagues, kept up with old students, wrote letters to distant friends. He took more time eating and looking at nature and wasted no time in front of TV sitcoms or movies of the week. He had created a cocoon of human activities conversation, interaction, affection and it filled his life like an overflowing soup bowl. I had also developed my own culture. Work. I did four or five media jobs in England, juggling them like a clown. I spent eight hours a day on a computer, feeding my stories back to the States. Then I did TV pieces, traveling with a crew throughout parts of London. I also phoned in radio reports every morning and afternoon. This was not an abnormal load. Over the years, I had taken labor as my companion and had moved everything else to the side. In Wimbledon, I ate meals at my little wooden work cubicle and thought nothing of it. On one particularly crazy day, 
a crush of reporters had tried to chase down Andre Agassi and his famous girlfriend, Brooke Shields, and I had gotten knocked over by a British photographer who barely muttered, sorry, before sweeping past, his huge metal lenses strapped around his neck. I thought of something else Maury had told me, so many people walk around with a meaningless life. They seem half asleep, even when they're busy doing things they think are important. This is because they're chasing the wrong things. The way you get meaning into your life is to devote yourself to loving others, devote yourself to your community around you, and devote yourself to creating something that gives you purpose and meaning. I knew he was right. Not that I did anything about it. At the end of the tournament and the countless cups of coffee I drank to get through it I closed my computer, cleaned out my cubicle, and went back to the apartment to pack. It was late. The TV was nothing but fuzz. I flew to Detroit, arrived late in the afternoon, dragged myself home and went to sleep. I awoke to a jolting piece of news, the unions at my newspaper had gone on strike. The place was shut down. There were picketers at the front entrance and marchers chanting up and down the street. As a member of the union, I had no choice, I was suddenly, and for the first time in my life, out of a job, out of a paycheck and pitted against my employers. Union leaders called my home and warned me against any contact with my former editors, many of whom were my friends, telling me to hang up if they tried to call and plead their case. We're going to fight until we win, the union leaders swore, sounding like soldiers. I felt confused and depressed. Although the TV and radio work were nice supplements, the newspaper had been my lifeline, my oxygen. When I saw my stories in print in each morning, I knew that, in at least one way, I was alive. Now it was gone. And as the strike continued the first day, the second day, the third day there were worried phone calls and rumors that this could go on for months. Everything I had known was upside down. There were sporting events each night that I would have gone to cover. Instead, I stayed home, watched them on TV. I had grown used to thinking readers somehow needed my column. I was stunned at how easily things went on without me. After a week of this, I picked up the phone and dialed Maury's number. Connie brought him to the phone. You're coming to visit me, he said, less a question than a statement. Well. Could I? How about Tuesday? Tuesday would be good, I said. Tuesday would be fine. In my sophomore year, I take two more of his courses. We go beyond the classroom, meeting now and then just to talk. I have never done this before with an adult who was not a relative, yet I feel comfortable doing it with Maury, and he seems comfortable making the time. Where shall we visit today, he asks cheerily when I enter his office. In the spring, we sit under a tree outside the sociology building, and in the winter, we sit by his desk, me in my grey sweatshirts and Adidas sneakers, Maury in Rockport shoes and corduroy pants. Each time we talk, Lai listens to me ramble, then he tries to pass on some sort of life lesson. He warns me that money is not the most important thing, contrary to the popular view on campus. He tells me I need to be fully human. He speaks of the alienation of youth and the need for connectedness with the society around me. Some of these things I understand, some I do not. It makes no difference. The discussions give me an excuse to talk to him, fatherly conversations I cannot have with my own father, who would like me to be a lawyer. Maury hates lawyers. What do you want to do when you get out of college, he asks. I want to be a musician, I say. Piano player. Wonderful, he says. But that's a hard life. Yeah. A lot of sharks. That's what I hear. Still, he says, if you really want it, then you'll make your dream happen. I want to hug him, to thank him for saying that, but I am not that open. I only nod instead. I'll bet you play piano with a lot of pep, he says. I laugh. Pep? He laughs back. Pep. What's the matter? They don't say that anymore. 
The first Tuesday we talk about the world. Connie opened the door and let me in. Maury was in his wheelchair by the kitchen table, wearing a loose cotton shirt and even looser black sweatpants. They were loose because his legs had atrophied beyond normal clothing size you could get two hands around his thighs and have your fingers touch. Had he been able to stand, he'd have been no more than five feet tall, and he'd probably have fit into a sixth grader's jeans. I got you something, I announced, holding up a brown paper bag. I had stopped on my way from the airport at a nearby supermarket and purchased some turkey, potato salad, macaroni salad, and bagels. I knew there was plenty of food at the house, but I wanted to contribute something. I was so powerless to help Maury otherwise. And I remembered his fondness for eating. Ah, so much food, he sang. Well. Now you have to eat it with me. We sat at the kitchen table, surrounded by wicker chairs. This time, without the need to make up sixteen years of information, we slid quickly into the familiar waters of our old college dialogue, Maury asking questions, listening to my replies, stopping like a chef to sprinkle in something I'd forgotten or hadn't realized. He asked about the newspaper strike, and true to form, he couldn't understand why both sides didn't simply communicate with each other and solve their problems. I told him not everyone was as smart as he was. Occasionally, he had to stop to use the bathroom, a process that took some time. Connie would will him to the toilet, then lift him from the chair and support him as he urinated into the beaker. Each time he came back, he looked tired. Do you remember when I told Ted Koppel that pretty soon someone was gonna have to wipe my ass, he said. I laughed. You don't forget a moment like that. Well, I think that day is coming. That one bothers me. Why? Because it's the ultimate sign of dependency. Someone wiping your bottom. But I'm working on it. I'm trying to enjoy the process. Enjoy it? Yes. After all, I get to be a baby one more time. That's a unique way of looking at it. Well, I have to look at life uniquely now. Let's face it. I can't go shopping, I can't take care of the bank accounts, I can't take out the garbage. But I can sit here with my dwindling days and look at what I think is important in life. I have both the time and the reason to do that. So, I said, in a reflexively cynical response, I guess the key to finding the meaning of life is to stop taking out the garbage? He laughed, and I was relieved that he did. As Connie took the plates away, I noticed a stack of newspapers that had obviously been read before I got there. You bother keeping up with the news, I asked. Yes, Maury said. Do you think that's strange? Do you think because I'm dying, I shouldn't care what happens in this world? Maybe. He sighed. Maybe you're right. Maybe I shouldn't care. After all, I won't be around to see how it all turns out. But it's hard to explain, Mitch. Now that I'm suffering, I feel closer to people who suffer than I ever did before. The other night, on TV, I saw people in Bosnia running across the street, getting fired upon, killed, innocent victims, and I just started to cry. I feel their anguish as if it were my own. I don't know any of these people. But how can I put this, I'm almost drawn to them. His eyes got moist, and I tried to change the subject, but he dabbed his face and waved me off. I cry all the time now, he said. Never mind. Amazing, I thought. I worked in the news business. I covered stories where people died. I interviewed grieving family members. I even attended the funerals. I never cried. Maury, for the suffering of people half a world away, was weeping. Is this what comes at the end, I wondered? Maybe death is the great equalizer, the one big thing that can finally make strangers shed a tear for one another. Maury honked loudly into the tissue. This is okay with you, isn't it? Men crying? Sure, I said, too quickly. He grinned. Ah, uh, Mitch, 
I'm gonna loosen you up. One day, I'm gonna show you it's okay to cry. Yeah, yeah, I said. Yeah, yeah, he said. We laughed because he used to say the same thing nearly 20 years earlier. Mostly on Tuesdays. In fact, Tuesday had always been our day together. Most of my courses with Maury were on Tuesdays, he had office hours on Tuesdays, and when I wrote my senior thesis which was pretty much Maury's suggestion, right from the start it was on Tuesdays that we sat together, by his desk, or in the cafeteria, or on the steps of Perlman Hall, going over the work. So it seemed only fitting that we were back together on a Tuesday, here in the house with the Japanese maple out front. As I ready to go, I mentioned this to Mori. We're Tuesday people, he said. Tuesday people, I repeated. Mori smiled. Mitch, you asked about caring for people I don't even know. But can I tell you the thing I'm learning most with this disease? What's that? The most important thing in life is to learn how to give out love, and to let it come in. His voice dropped to a whisper. Let it come in. We think we don't deserve love, we think if we let it in we'll become too soft. But a wise man named Levine said it right. He said, love is the only rational act. He repeated it carefully, pausing for effect, love is the only rational act. I nodded, like a good student, and he exhaled weakly. I leaned over to give him a hug. And then, although it is not really like me, I kissed him on the cheek. I felt his weakened hands on my arms, the thin stubble of his whiskers brushing my face. So you'll come back next Tuesday, he whispered. He enters the classroom, sits down, doesn't say anything. He looks at it's, we look at him. At first, there are a few giggles, but Mori only shrugs, and eventually a deep silence falls and we begin to notice the smallest sounds, the radiator humming in the corner of the room, the nasal breathing of one of the fat students. Some of us are agitated. When is Lai going to say something? We squirm, check our watches. A few students look out the window, trying to be above it all. This goes on a good 15 minutes, before Mori finally breaks in with a whisper. What's happening here, he asks. And slowly a discussion begins as Mori has wanted all along about the effect of silence on human relations. My are we embarrassed by silence? What comfort do we find in all the noise? I am not bothered by the silence. For all the noise I make with my friends, I am still not comfortable talking about my feelings in front of others especially and not classmates. I could sit in the quiet for hours if that is what the class demanded. On my way out, Maury stops me. You didn't say much today, he remarks. I don't know. I just didn't have anything to add. I think you have a lot to add. In fact, Mitch, you remind me of someone I knew who also liked to keep things to himself when he was younger. Who? Me. The second Tuesday we talk about feeling sorry for yourself. I came back the next Tuesday. And for many Tuesdays that followed. I looked forward to these visits more than one would think, considering I was flying 700 miles to sit alongside a dying man. But I seemed to slip into a time warp when I visited Mori, and I liked myself better when I was there. I no longer rented a cellular phone for the rides from the airport. Let them wait, I told myself, mimicking Mori. The newspaper situation in Detroit had not improved. In fact, it had grown increasingly insane, with nasty confrontations between picketers and replacement workers, people arrested, beaten, lying in the street in front of delivery trucks. In light of this, my visits with Maury felt like a cleansing rinse of human kindness. We talked about life and we talked about love. We talked about one of Maury's favorite subjects, compassion, and why our society had such a shortage of it. Before my third visit, I stopped at a market called Bread and Circus I had seen their bags in Maury's house and figured he must like the food there and I loaded up with plastic containers from their fresh food takeaway, things like vermicelli with vegetables and carrot soup and baklava. When I entered Maury's study, 
I lifted the bags as if I'd just robbed a bank. Food man. I bellowed. Mori rolled his eyes and smiled. Meanwhile, I looked for signs of the disease's progression. His fingers worked well enough to write with a pencil, or hold up his glasses, but he could not lift his arms much higher than his chest. He was spending less and less time in the kitchen or living room and more in his study, where he had a large reclining chair set up with pillows, blankets, and specially cut pieces of foam rubber that held his feet and gave support to his withered legs. He kept a bell near his side, and when his head needed adjusting or he had to go on the commode, as he referred to it, he would shake the bell and Connie, Tony, Bertha, or Amy his small army of home care workers would come in. It wasn't always easy for him to lift the bell, and he got frustrated when he couldn't make it work. I asked Maury if he felt sorry for himself. Sometimes, in the mornings, he said. That's when I mourn. I feel around my body, I move my fingers and my hands whatever I can still move and I mourn what I've lost. I mourn the slow, insidious way in which I'm dying. But then I stop mourning. Just like that? I give myself a good cry if I need it. But then I concentrate on all the good things still in my life. On the people who are coming to see me. On the stories I'm going to hear. On you if it's Tuesday. Because we're Tuesday people. I grinned. Tuesday people. Mitch, I don't allow myself any more self-pity than that. A little each morning, a few tears, and that's all. I thought about all the people I knew who spent many of their waking hours feeling sorry for themselves. How useful it would be to put a daily limit on self-pity. Just a few tearful minutes, then on with the day. And if Maury could do it, with such a horrible disease. It's only horrible if you see it that way, Maury said. It's horrible to watch my body slowly wilt away to nothing. But it's also wonderful because of all the time I get to say goodbye. He smiled. Not everyone is so lucky. I studied him in his chair, unable to stand, to wash, to pull on his pants. Lucky? Did he really say lucky? During a break, when Maury had to use the bathroom, I leafed through the Boston newspaper that sat near his chair. There was a story about a small timber town where two teenage girls tortured and killed a 73-year-old man who had befriended them, then threw a party in his trailer home and showed off the corpse. There was another story, about the upcoming trial of a straight man who killed a gay man after the latter had gone on a TV talk show and said he had a crush on him. I put the paper away. Maury was rolled back in smiling, as always Anne Connie went to lift him from the wheelchair to the recliner. You want me to do that? I asked. There was a momentary silence, and I'm not even sure why I offered, but Maury looked at Connie and said, can you show him how to do it? Sure, Connie said. Following her instructions, I leaned over, locked my forearms under Maury's armpits, and hooked him toward me, as if lifting a large log from underneath. Then I straightened up, hoisting him as I rose. Normally, when you lift someone, you expect their arms to tighten around your grip, but Maury could not do this. He was mostly dead weight, and I felt his head bounce softly on my shoulder and his body sag against me like a big damp loaf. Ahn, he softly groaned. I gotcha, I gotcha, I said. Holding him like that moved me in a way I cannot describe, except to say I felt the seeds of death inside his shriveling frame, and as I laid him in his chair, adjusting his head on the pillows, I had the coldest realization that our time was running out. And I had to do something. It is my junior year, 1978, when disco and Rocky movies are the cultural rage. We are in an unusual sociology class at Brandeis, something Maury calls, group process. Each week we study the ways in which the students in the group interact with one another, how they respond to anger, jealousy, attention. We are human lab rats. More often than not, someone ends up crying. I refer to it as the, touchy, feely, course. Maury says I should be more open-minded. 
On this day, Mori says he has an exercise for us to try. We are to stand, facing away from our classmates, and fall backward, relying on another student to catch us. Most of us are uncomfortable with this, and we cannot let go for more than a few inches before stopping ourselves. We laugh in embarrassment. Finally, one student, a thin, quiet, dark-haired girl whom I notice almost always wears bulky white fisherman sweaters, crosses her arms over her chest, closes her eyes, leans back, and does not flinch, like one of those Lipton tea commercials where the model splashes into the pool. For a moment, I am sure she is going to thump on the floor. At the last instant, her assigned partner grabs her head and shoulders and yanks her up harshly. Whoa, several students yell. Some clap. Mori underscore finally smiles. You see, he says to the girl, you closed your eyes. That was the difference. Sometimes you cannot believe what you see, you have to believe what you feel. And if you are ever going to have other people trust you, you must feel that you can trust them, too even when you're in the dark. Even when you're falling. The third Tuesday we talk about regrets. The next Tuesday, I arrived with the normal bags of food pasta with corn, potato salad, apple cobbler and something else, a Sony tape recorder. I want to remember what we talk about, I told Mori. I want to have your voice so I can listen to it, later. When I'm dead. Don't say that. He laughed. Mitch, I'm going to die. And sooner, not later. He regarded the new machine. So big, he said. I felt intrusive, as reporters often do, and I began to think that a tape machine between two people who were supposedly friends was a foreign object, an artificial ear. With all the people clamoring for his time, perhaps I was trying to take too much away from these Tuesdays. Listen, I said, picking up the recorder. We don't have to use this. If it makes you uncomfortable. He stopped me, wagged a finger, then hooked his glasses off his nose, letting them dangle on the string around his neck. He looked me square in the eye. Put it down, he said. I put it down. Mitch, he continued, softly now, you don't understand. I want to tell you about my life. I want to tell you before I can't tell you anymore. His voice dropped to a whisper. I want someone to hear my story. Will you? I nodded. We sat quietly for a moment. So, he said, is it turned on? Now, the truth is, that tape recorder was more than nostalgia. I was losing Mori, we were all losing Mori his family, his friends, his ex-students, his fellow professors, his pals from the political discussion groups that he loved so much, his former dance partners, all of us. And I suppose tapes, like photographs and videos, are a desperate attempt to steal something from death's suitcase. But it was also becoming clear to me through his courage, his humor, his patience, and his openness that Mori was looking at life from some very different place than anyone else I knew. A healthier place. A more sensible place. And he was about to die. If some mystical clarity of thought came when you looked death in the eye, then I knew Mori wanted to share it. And I wanted to remember it for as long as I could. The first time I saw Mori on Nightline, one wondered what regrets he had once he knew his death was imminent. Did he lament lost friends? Would he have done much differently? Selfishly, I wondered if I were in his shoes, would I be consumed with sad thoughts of all that I had missed? Would I regret the secrets I had kept hidden? When I mentioned this to Mori, he nodded. It's what everyone worries about, isn't it? What if today were my last day on earth? He studied my face, and perhaps he saw an ambivalence about my own choices. I had this vision of me keeling over at my desk one day, halfway through a story, my editors snatching the copy even as the medics carried my body away. Mitch? Maury said. I shook my head and said nothing. But Maury picked up on my hesitation. Mitch, he said, the culture doesn't encourage you to think about such things until you're about to die. 
We're so wrapped up with egotistical things, career, family, having enough money, meeting the mortgage, getting a new car, fixing the radiator when it breaks we are involved in trillions of little acts just to keep going. So we don't get into the habit of standing back and looking at our lives and saying, is this all? Is this all I want? Is something missing? He paused. You need someone to probe you in that direction. It won't just happen automatically. I knew what he was saying. We all need teachers in our lives. And mine was sitting in front of me. Fine, I figured. If I was to be the student, then I would be as good a student as I could be. On the plane ride home that day, I made a small list on a yellow legal pad, issues and questions that we all grapple with, from happiness to aging to having children to death. Of course, there were a million self-help books on these subjects, and plenty of cable TV shows, and $9 Oprah hour consultation sessions. America had become a Persian bazaar of self-help. But there still seemed to be no clear answers. Do you take care of others or take care of your inner child? Return to traditional values or reject tradition as useless? Seek success or seek simplicity? Just say no or just do it? All I knew was this, Maury, my old professor, wasn't in the self-help business. He was standing on the tracks, listening to death's locomotive whistle, and he was very clear about the important things in life. I wanted that clarity. Every confused and tortured soul I knew wanted that clarity. Ask me anything, Maury always said. So I wrote this list, death. Fear. Aging. Greed. Marriage. Family. Society. Forgiveness. A meaningful life. The list was in my bag when I returned to West Newton for the fourth time, a Tuesday in late August when the air conditioning at the Logan Airport terminal was not working, and people fanned themselves and wiped sweat angrily from their foreheads, and every face I saw looked ready to kill somebody. By the start of my senior year, I have taken so many sociology classes, I am only a few credits shy of a degree. Maury suggests I try an honors thesis. Me? I ask. What would I write about? What interests you, he says. We bat it back and forth, until we finally settle on, of all things, sports. I begin a year-long project on how football in America has become ritualistic, almost a religion, an opiate for the masses. I have no idea that this is training for my future career. I only know it gives me another once-a-week session with Maury. And, with his help, by spring I have a 112-page thesis, researched, footnoted, documented, and neatly bound in black leather. I show it to Maury with the pride of a little leaguer rounding the bases on his first home run. Congratulations, Maury says. I grin as he leafs through it, and I glance around his office. The shelves of books, the hardwood floor, the throw rug, the couch. I think to myself that I have sat just about everywhere there is to sit in this room. I don't know, Mitch, Maury muses, adjusting his glasses as he reads, with work like this, we may have to get you back here for grad school. Yeah, right, I say. I snicker, but the idea is momentarily appealing. Part of me is scared of leaving school. Part of me wants to go desperately. Tension of opposites. I watch Maury as he reads my thesis, and wonder what the big world will be like out there. 